we have today to play with? Hmm. Asus Crosshair 5 Formula. Hmm. Hmm. Yeah, I think a, uh, FX8320, yeah, that'll, that'll, that'll go nicely. Line the arrow. Drop in. That'll do. Yeah. Yeah, that, that, that looks nice. Oh, wait. No onboard graphics. Huh. This is gonna be fun. The AMD FX series of CPUs can be considered a polarizing architecture for many reasons. More cores means more scores means more fears means more tears. You see, with names like Bulldozer and Piledriver, AMD was trying to send a message that these CPUs were heavy lifters and could land a punch against the prevailing Intel market share dominance. And to all the fanboys on the internet, this was the perfect architecture to pick battles over. Well, well, my CPU has more cores. Well, well, my CPU has an unlocked multiplier and yours doesn't. Take that, Wintel. But all of that noise is for naught unless a system is able to accomplish one very crucial task, work. When I first began planning for this video, I was not prepared for the events that would transpire during the making of it. I planned for, at most, an overclock of 4.2 to 4.3 GHz, and never had I entertained the idea that it would keep pulling all the way to 5. Between that and the graphics card overclock that kept pulling and pulling, more on that in a minute, this project sort of ran out of control. This video is no longer a PC review, and I want that to sink in. This computer outperforms 99% of the computers with the same hardware, and performance numbers are not indicative of what you should expect out of a similar build. Instead, this is an absolute best case scenario. Part two of this video exists because I was told about the drama surrounding the bulldozer pile driver by share of processors. It piqued my curiosity, but I almost let the subject slide to save time. That is, until the recent court decision to allow the lawsuit against AMD regarding these processors to continue. It gets a little weird here, so bear with me as I try to explain the complexity that is the engineering of the bulldozer architecture. The AMD FX 8300 series of CPUs all feature 8 cores at various clock speeds in TDP. On paper, this looks appealing to the offering that is the Intel Core i7 at the time, since the top tier K series unlocked CPUs from Intel featured 4 cores with hyperthreading technology, making for 8 virtual CPU cores instead of 8 physical ones. Theoretically, this should make the AMD offering a much better value, especially since the K-series unlocked Intel i7s, the only ones able to overclock without changing base clocks, were far more expensive than the AMD counterparts. Core count and base clocks aren't everything that make a processor perform well though, and what consumers and enthusiasts did not take into account was the IPC, instructions per cycle, or rather, how much work can be done in one hertz of operation, and architectural limits. The latter would be even more confusing as time went on after launch as a lawsuit was filed against AMD for their marketing wording, stating that AMD was not selling true 8-core processors, rather they were a quasi-quad-core processor with an additional compute unit attached. Confusing? I know. To save on headache, I'll read part of the article detailing what exactly the suit is saying. Quote, At the heart of the matter is the design of the bulldozer microarchitecture. AMD groups bulldozer cores into pairs, and each pair is called a module. So for example, an 8-core processor has 4 modules. Within each module, alongside two x86 cores, is a single branch prediction engine, a single instruction fetch and decode stage, a single floating point math unit, a single cache controller, a single 64 kilobyte level 1 instruction cache, a single microcode ROM, and a single 2 megabyte level 2 cache. 
In other words, in each module, the cores share a lot of plumbing to fetch, decode, and execute software instructions. Individually, the cores have their own integer math unit, load storage engine, and other bits and pieces. Internally, you can see the four modules, the four sets of L2 caches, and the four sets of L3 caches. Let's give a little bit more detail about what's under the hood. As you can see, within a single module, there are two cores next to each other and shared blocks of electronics between both. The branch prediction engine tries to guess which instructions the running thread will execute next, allowing it to fetch and decode program data early and optimize execution. There's also a single floating point math unit shared between the core twins. When processing integer calculations, each bulldozer module acts as a dual core processor. And here's the interesting part. When crunching more complex math, each module only has one floating point unit, which suggests, theoretically, that each module drops down to single core performance when crunching floating point values, although AMD insists that its design allows two threads access to the FPU at the same time, so the performance hit isn't at the end of the world. Since this article has been published, architectures have come and gone, yet people still see fit to debate the issue, so I decided out of pure curiosity to try and test that last line's hypothesis to see how well it would hold up, especially with an overclock of this magnitude. In theory, the faster the CPU is clocked, the more deficit you should be able to see between two cores swamping the same FPU and a single core getting the FPU all to itself. I realize that this is not the most scientific of studies in that it is a sample size of one, which means take it with a grain of salt but I'm already pretty sure of what the outcome should be. System Specs! For the CPU, we have from the Vichera architecture the AMD FX8320 8-core processor. Stock, this processor has a base clock of 3.5GHz and a turbo up to 4. The clock speed was increased to a stable 5GHz on all cores for these tests. The GPU is our trusty EVGA GTX 980Ti with 6GB of VRAM. This card performed magnificently in every test thrown at it, and once its quirks were found and ironed out, a 145 MHz overclock on the GPU core was achieved, and a staggering 650 MHz overclock on GPU memory was achieved. For RAM, we have a 4x4GB kit of Corsair Dominator Platinum running at 1866 MHz, with timing set at the manufacturer recommended 910-926 configuration. The motherboard is an ASUS ROG Crosshair 5 formula, a motherboard lauded for its stability, easy-to-use yet feature-rich BIOS, and its numerous nice-to-have features such as the AI overclock tuner and individually enabled modules. The testing methodology this time around is slightly different. Between now and my last video, I have acquired a 1440p display, and this PC is powerful enough that benchmarks at this resolution are warranted. After testing at this resolution with all cores enabled, I went back and performed the same tests again with half the cores disabled to test the validity of the FPU argument. I have been messing with frame time measurements, but I'm not trained well enough in it yet to start using those sort of figures in my videos, so that's just going to have to be for a later time. On to the tests! First up out of our 8 core tests, we have the classic War Thunder that's been a staple of these videos. The Pacific Day benchmark managed to net an average frame per second figure of 201.1 and a minimal of 120.6 and at that frame rate, there was no visible lag or stuttering. The tank CPU benchmark was nice to watch, the average FPS hitting a respectable 66.7, with the minimal figure being 55.5. Unfortunately, these figures are still below 60, so even with VSync on, there's a chance that the person playing ground forces in this game might notice a stutter here and there when playing on this specific system. Testing at 1080p in the CPU tests netted no difference within margins of error, so these runs will be disregarded. Car Mechanic Simulator 2015 shows just how GPU bound it is by posting an average frame rate in the 200s, a low of 121, and the peak figure was seen to be around 425 at 1440p. This machine is more than capable of handling this game. The most modern game tested in our lineup today is Forza Horizon 4. This game is definitely more GPU bound on this build than anything, so the tests at both resolutions can be used. At 1440p, the built-in benchmark, which was so very nice of them to include in the game, thank you Microsoft, scored an average of 71 frames per second and it was a very smooth experience. The fact that it can handle above 60 frames in 2K resolution is a display of just how powerful the 980 Ti is for a 2015 card. The 2015 King of 4K is still a contender in the ring for sure. Moving on to 1080p, the average frame rate was 10 higher at 81 frames per second. High values were over 100, and that's really impressive for this game. I have a friend who has the same video card in his rig as I have, only with an i7-8700K for his CPU. So I had him run the benchmark as a comparison to see just how much the graphics overclocking had netted me in performance. The CPU scores are much higher, but since we're GPU bound this time, this is fine, 
and we can see that the overclock card wins by a good margin. An average of 7 frames more per second is certainly nothing to sneeze at. I was going to include GTA 5 in this lineup, but when performing the 4 core tests, it refused to launch. If I was to hit my own deadline for this video, I had no time left to diagnose this. New to my test suite is how well a given system can handle emulation. I loaded up ROMs for both Mario Kart Double Dash and Super Mario Sunshine, upscaled them 4 times from native to 1440p, and then applied 8x MSAA and FXAA. I figured that sort of scaling and fidelity would definitely slow the system down, but it handled it like a champ. Super Mario Sunshine has frame cap to 25 frames a second due to the game engine, and Mario Kart ran at 60 just fine, both games looking stellar with the graphical enhancements enabled. This rig could certainly be a nice emulation station setup, especially with multiple controllers hooked into a hub, allowing for multiplayer fun to be had. Moving on to Cinebench R15, at the CPU's stock frequency, the Cinebench score was a paltry 565. This score was close to being beaten by a quad-core low-power laptop i7. With the 5GHz overclock, a score of 799 was observed, faster than the quad-core third-generation desktop i7 and closing in on the tail of a fourth-generation Haswell desktop K-series i7. Not bad for what was essentially a budget, and I say this with air quotes, gaming CPU from 2012. A quick run with Passmark using just the CPU benchmarks netted a score of 11,169. Pay close attention to the floating point math scored here, at a score of 10,946, as this is an important piece of information for later. 3 Mark's Time Spy benchmark basically made this project drag on a lot longer than I had anticipated, as I kept getting gain after gain after making tweaks. CPU overclock, RAM timings, RAM speed, GPU memory clock, GPU core voltage and power limits, GPU core clocks, they were all tweaked to try to climb the leaderboard, and climb this system did. This rig was able to push all the way up into the top 10 rank of scores with the same hardware, settling into 7th place worldwide. I'm happy with these results, and this process getting there was a learning experience with a lot of trial and error and research being done. Eventually, the tweaking got so intense that I even had to find a way to mount an all-in-one liquid cooler to the GPU to keep it cool under load. While these numbers are fresh on your mind, I'll move straight into the quad-core tests. Only a few tests were run in this category, as they displayed perfectly the sort of gains and losses one would see at half the cores on the FX platform. In my list of benchmarks, War Thunder is king of the single-core score and really didn't disappoint. Average frames per second in the Pacific Day benchmark was 187.2 with a minimal score of 101.3. A hit of 20 FPS was unexpected, but is not within margin of error. It didn't really affect visuals all that much, but it was still unexpected. Tank CPU benchmark is up next, and average frames per second hit 62 with a minimal of 52.3, indicating that when GPU loads aren't factored in, the single core nature of War Thunder means that you see very little difference between 4 and 8 cores. Forza Horizon 4, however, is a different story. This game is a very different beast under the hood from War Thunder. Being a DX12 title with proper multi-core support, performance hits were seen across the board with four cores disabled. Average FPS sat around 52 with increased stutter counted by the benchmark tool. Time Spy also took a decent hit in performance with a score of 4422, more than a thousand points lost in comparison to the record run that was made with eight cores. Cinebench R15 shows just how much work is done when all 8 cores are firing strong, as at 4 cores a score of 400 was seen. This score falls in line with the Core 2 Extreme QX9650 when overclocked to 3.8 GHz. Think about that for a second. The quad core score, with an extreme overclock, is trading blows with a CPU 5 years its senior. This only highlights that the strength of the AMD FX CPUs are in core counts and clock speeds. Without that, the IPC of the Intel chips just walk all over them. The final benchmark I'm going to show you is the quad-core Passmark benchmark. A net score of 6826 was recorded. Remember whenever I said to pay attention to the floating point value earlier? Take a look at the quad-core score. With a floating point score of 5183, this puts the final nail in the coffin of the idea that the shared FPUs are the choking points of these CPUs. Not only did AMD include workarounds for this issue before the CPUs were even released, but Microsoft also introduced a patch in Windows 7 shortly after the release of the FX lineup so that Windows Task Scheduler wouldn't inadvertently sabotage FX performance. Between these points and the fact that absolutely no single core games were seen at all from disabling the second core in each package, the FPU controversy is looking a little weak. The FX lineup is in a position to age gracefully on the gaming side of computing. Performance was not all of that stellar when they launched, and single core performance is still something of a disappointment, but more games are being written with multi-core enhancements since the release of DX12, and I do believe that this platform still has a few years left in it before it hits obsolete status. 
it's certainly a good enough platform to be my main gaming rig until either my Xeon workstation is back up and running, or until the release of Zen 2 later this year by AMD. With its low entry cost and high relative performance, I can recommend this platform to beginner gamers and budget builders. 8320s can be had on eBay for $50, and AM3 motherboards can be had for less than that, making it a great value for someone who wants around the same performance as a new Ryzen 3 2200G, with whom the 8320 trades blows with when not overclocked, but can't afford the ridiculous prices of DDR4 and a new, more modern motherboard. Stay tuned for my next video as I put this CPU through its paces even harder, as I have a surprise GPU upgrade coming shortly, and it is quite the beast. This is the Dorky Quine signing out. Have a nice day.